So we're on. Good morning, all you rise and shine early birds. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, we were just talking about the fact that we are computer driven and uh, we can't start until the computer decides to say, okay, now you can go. So we're uh, on and we're glad that the computer agreed with us this morning. Sometimes the computer doesn't agree with us. So turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and we are going to continue the same vein of things that we were talking about the last uh, two or three weeks and that has to do with the transfer, the difference between the <clears throat> time frame of the book of Acts in which Paul wrote the first six books that he wrote and said the things that he said and the time frame after the end of the book of Acts which Paul wrote the seven books and the things which he said. Now we're in Ephesians 6 and the book of Ephesians now if this is the, the famous line, middle wall partition line Ephesians is written on this side, and it's like the doctrine is like Colossians. Ephesians and Colossians. I said something last week that probably wasn't real clear. I said the difference between the Ephesian doctrine and the Colossian doctrine, and what I meant was the difference between Ephesians and Colossians doctrine versus the earlier doctrine. So uh, I... I, I, do, I think you all know this, but I do believe that Colossians and Ephesians is the, is the epitome of the doctrine that fits us today. Now, in Ephesians 6, <clears throat> Paul says something. He says this in two or three places. He uses this word in two or three places. And it's an indication, not that he's done talking, but that he's got, he has gotten to a point where if you can see this, then you're going to see several things. And in this case, it's in chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, my brethren. If you remember in Philippians, starting in Philippians 3, he says, finally, four times before he finishes writing that book. Now, here in, in Ephesians 6, though, this finally tells the brethren, that be you saved people, whoever... Us saved people are. Listen up, saved people. Finally, my brethren, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God. Well, why? Because now you got all the information and somebody is going to attack you. You see, here's the thing. It isn't just some preacher who disagrees with us that attacks us. Or, it isn't just some fleshly problem that we, that we have within ourselves that the devil knows about that he can thereby attack us. Or, it isn't just the local gendarmes or the authorities who have some hold over us who can attack us. Bless your soul, it's all of them. And it's something else. You listed in the, the seven things which God hates. He that soweth discord among brethren. There's two things you need to know about that. He that soweth discord among brethren is not somebody who sows discord by causing an argument. It's somebody who might have caused discord by causing an argument that won't leave it alone that continually keeps it a broil. You know how arguments go away? They go away with time. So they didn't get settled. Right. How many times do you think that's going to happen in your life that you have arguments with somebody that's not ever going to get settled? I'll remind you of Pat DeBose's famous words to me one time after I'd argued with him. I said, Pat, I'm sorry I didn't mean to get so upset about that. And he says, Oh, that's all right, Jerry. Everybody's entitled to their own stupid opinion. So what are you talking about? It. You're not going to settle every argument you have. But the guy who won't leave those alone, who just has to bring it up one more time, or who just has to figure out another way to worm into your life and say, He said, I heard him say, I heard him say. What's his point? 
sowing discord among brethren is his point. <clears throat> the only reason I can ever think of is about sowing discord among brethren is to gain an advantage. It's the only reason to do it. Say, well, yeah, but they, him and his brother were wrong. And so I pointed out to him while he was wrong. Well, why don't you leave that truth in his hands and let the Lord handle that? Let the Lord handle it. Does it have to be in a conversation that's not in just plain teaching of the Word of God that you bring up something that's going to cause discord among brethren? Now, on the other side of this, the other big side, I mean, that's the big one about Bible doctrine and so forth. That's the big thing about sowing discord among brethren. Please notice that that, verse, that phrase back there does not say, he that soweth discord among the brethren. It's more personal than that. He that soweth discord among brethren gets between two people. He that soweth discord among brethren. Now, but the other thing about it is not just Bible doctrine. What can affect someone's life and their um, um, uh, I hate to use the word ability here, but it's the only word I can think of. Their ability to put forth the Word of God and to teach the doctrine of the Word of God, what inhibits that, what gets in the way of that could be the flesh. It could be emotional. It could be, it could cause a failure to understand the distinction between spiritual things and fleshly things. Not fleshy things, fleshly. Things that happen after the flesh. They're not the same as spiritual things. They ought never to be included, the two together. So, well, it affects us that way. Well, then stop letting it affect you affect you that way and get over whatever it is that keeps your spiritual mind from being a spiritual mind and get on with it. I don't care whether it means you have to stop doing something you love to do, stop going someplace that you have to, but you have to worry about what that, what's going on in your spiritual mind. And if it means getting away from someone who keeps you in that broil, get away from them. The Lord never called you unto fleshliness. He called you unto righteousness and holiness. So, out here sits this doctrine. All of the doctrine of the body of Christ begins to be formed by the preaching of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. As the body of Christ begins to unfold in its position, those first six books that Paul wrote, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, when those books are unfolded, they're there. They're there in total. Last week we talked for an hour about Romans chapter uh, 1 and 2 and the context of why Paul said that when he did. Done. We're done. We're not done with it, but we're done seeing that he did that. <clears throat> While we may use a lot of detail from these books, but we're done seeing that that's over with. I mean, come on, you've got all the doctrine of God. You're not living in the time frame of Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 20. You're living in the 21st century. You're living... 1900 plus, depending on how old you are, years after Christ died for your sins. And as a consequence of that, you've got all of the doctrine and you've always had it. So when he says, put on the whole armor of God, he's talking about you putting everything, all of this doctrine in place. You don't put the breastplate of righteousness on your back. You don't carry the helmet of salvation under your arm or tucked into your hip pocket. You put the whole armor of God on properly. It's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Take heed unto the doctrine. In so doing, you save yourself and them that hear you. 1 Timothy 5, last verse, whatever that is. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2, verse 7. 
You know, Wednesday night I made a, a comment about the fact that <clears throat> that Paul wrote to the men who were going to take his place. And yes, you can say, well, they've been preaching with him for years. Yes, but they were younger than him, and he was leaving them. And he wrote to them, second, he wrote First and Second Timothy and Titus, a total of 13 chapters in a King James Bible. King James Bible, the Lord has allowed us to use numbers as a remembrance. Surely you can remember that the 13th apostle wrote 13 chapters to people who were going to take his place. Subsequently, when we read those 13 chapters, we who are alive today, especially men, we who are alive today have something to say. And if you're a young man and you're starting to say it, bless your soul, you ain't going to get done. You're not going to get done. One of the last things that Brother Moore said to me was uh, jokingly and, and in the time frame when he probably wasn't even thinking real well, he said, well, Brother Lockhart, get her done. Well, you don't going to get her done. But you can get on with it because there's more doctrine to be shared, more application of doctrine to be shared than you'll have time for. Life will get in your way before you get her done. So just get after it. All of it. All the time. Notice. Ephesians chapter 6. He describes putting that armor on. And when he gets down to it. Well, I'll get to what, I'm <coughs> what I want to talk to you about here momentarily. <coughs> he says verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Do you understand why the doctrine of perseverance came into being? Uh, those who speak the doctrine of perseverance as the pea of the tulip have misused the passage, and they've misused the word perseverance too, by the way, in their application of that doctrine. But you can see right there where it came from. It's the final part, if you will, of that uh, armor, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Do you know what all prayer and supplication in the Spirit would apply to? Everything you say to the Lord and everything you hear back from the Lord. And watching thereunto with all person, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Semicolon then the rest of the prayer is to follow that, but being in addition to that which you just said, you just read. In other words, you've got this all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and the watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, semicolon. And then he says, and for me, Paul is our example 11 times, I think it was 9 or 11 Wednesday night, we talked about why we follow Paul. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, therefore you can transfer that by Ephesians, ah, 2 Timothy 1, verse 13 and 14, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, and 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, you can transfer that to your life right now. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Aha. This is the gospel. Unfolded in these six books. It is the mystery of Christ. That's what came to you in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. The gospel came to you in all of its fullness and completeness. <clears throat> but it didn't come to you because Paul wrote it to you. Paul wrote it as an explanation to the Jew first and also to the Greek who had believed the gospel. He wrote it as an explanation of the mystery of Christ. 
that Christ was coming back here was known. Christ in the future. And you come here and you have Christ in the present. He's there. The mystery of Christ was not that He was coming. The mystery of Christ was not that He was going to dwell with them. The mystery of Christ is that He was going to die for our sins according to the Scriptures, be buried and be raised again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that it was going to bring people into a justification uh, position, as in Romans 4, verse 24 and 25. And that's what's unfolded in those books. But the mystery of the gospel is over here. The mystery, not the mystery of Christ, that is the gospel. The mystery of the gospel is what Paul was completing by the doctrine of these books, those last seven books. He was completing the explanation of the mystery of the gospel. So he says, and for me, which would transfer specifically to you and I today, and by the way, everyone after Paul wrote these seven books. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in bonds. He's still an ambassador just like he was in 2 Timothy chapter 5. Now he's an ambassador in bonds. By the way, he did not go out of his country on, by the appointment of uh, the one who sent him to be sitting in Rome in prison. He was taken out of his country and put into a foreign land as an ambassador in bonds. It is, it is part and parcel to how he was in prison. He had his own hired house. He was a Roman citizen, so he had all these Rights and privileges. He was still a prisoner, but he was an ambassador in bonds for the benefit of the church, the body of Christ, to explain how the gospel could get even to those Romans. If he was still going to the Jew first, but also to the Greek, he never would have been put into bonds in Rome. You have to think about that a while. Now, back in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2. I don't want to start there. Sorry about that. I want to go back to Acts chapter 2. Hold on there to Ephesians 2 and go back to Acts chapter 20 again. Acts chapter 20. As Paul finishes this speech that he makes to the uh, Ephesian elders, he says, verse 26. He, in verse 25, he tells them they're not going to see him anymore. Verse 26, he says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now I'm going to tell you what I believe about verse 28, and you don't have to believe this, but I can't make heads or tails of several other things unless I see it this way. I am not trying to talk you into this. But I see <coughs> that they should take heed to the flock. This, this is a bunch of Ephesian elders. There was a synagogue in Ephesus. There was a... in the land that Ephesus was in. There were synagogues everywhere. There were Jews everywhere. And I know that these people are on more than, as of now, as of this moment in time, uh, in Acts chapter 20, in more than one case, they're involved in the gathering up of that offering 
that he's got with him at this time, fixing to take it to Jerusalem. Somebody in all those Gentile countries where he went to the Jew first in the synagogues, but also to the Gentiles who were present, and formed all those upwards of 20 different churches, congregations of people, Somebody in all those places was in agreement with him, and earlier it was Barnabas, but now him and Luke and Titus and Timothy, Silas. They were in agreement with him about caring for the poor, as Galatians chapter 2 explains, and they were contributing to it. I believe that when he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, that the word... Yourselves has a comma after it, and then the word and, to all the flock is a group of people. For these church of the body of Christ members to take heed unto. Because, according to the next phrase, over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers, then they were something of a, um, of a provider for this group of people. The next phrase says that as overseers and taking heed unto the flock, they were to feed the church of God. Well, now, once again, I, I, I understand about Thessalonian letter and on and on and on. I'm not trying to uh, make any grand distinctions here, but I want you to know something. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Now, if anyone argues with the, the common sense of this verse, they're going to have to go back to my old English teachers and have them correct me. But he says in verse 32, he's just got through talking about the meat and whatever and what, that it's not got anything to do with the kingdom of God anyway. Verse 32, give none offense. The word give is a verb. You start a sentence with a verb, you must insert the word you. You give none offense, neither to the Jews, well, that would be people that were of Paul's lineage that did not believe in Christ, nor to the Gentiles, that would be people who were not Jews who did not believe in Christ, nor to the church of God. Well, that's somebody who did believe in Christ. And it's not the church, the body of Christ. How do I know that? Because it is to the church, the body of Christ, in Corinth, that he is giving this instruction. You, church the body of Christ, give none offense, and he names three groups there for you to not be offensive to. All right? Now, but he says not, not to give any offense to the church of God. We'll look over in chapter 15. It's people who believe in Christ. They wouldn't be the church of God if they didn't believe in Christ. Okay, now look over in chapter 15. After he says the words of the gospel, he starts talking about the proof of his resurrection. Verse uh, 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as the one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Well then, same book, four chapters later, I know who the church of God in chapter 11 is. It's the ones Paul persecuted, which would be the rest of those apostles and it would cause him to say, I am the least of the apostles that am not me to be called an apostle. If you contrast his attitude about himself here in verse 9 versus his attitude in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about verse 9 through 13, you'll see what I mean. He wasn't saying he wasn't a good apostle or that he didn't have the gifts of an apostle. He says to those people that I just mentioned, I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted them. 
Well, if he persecuted them, then I know who the church of God is in chapter uh, 10, the last verse. The next to the last verse, 32. That's who the church of God is. Now notice, go back to Acts chapter 20 again. Verse 28, he says to these Ephesian elders, Take heed therefore unto yourselves unto all the flock. The church, the body of Christ, is never referred to as a flock, nor members of the body of Christ as sheep. And yet everything about Israel, the Israel of God, from the beginning to the end, is referred to as sheep of the pasture, and so on and so forth. He says, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. The modern day world wants to say, change that to shepherds. Not shepherds, it's overseers. Because you're not talking about men who tend to sheep. But you are talking about those who would look after them. In other words, be aware of the shepherds in the, uh, in, uh, in the church to feed this group the flock, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Bless your soul, Jesus Christ died for them just like he died for us. He paid the price for their sins just like he did, he paid the price for our sins. He's going to give them the atonement when at his, upon his return as the shepherd returning to the fold. Read Second Peter real carefully, uh, First Peter real carefully. But he hasn't yet given them the atonement. So who is it that oversees them? Who is it that is supposed to feed the church of God as long as it's here upon the earth to be fed? Those who already are, are, are uh, free to do so, having already received the atonement. He's already written Romans 5 verse 11 here. And as long as there is a church of God, in existence, these Ephesian elders are supposed to... He doesn't give this instruction, by the way. He doesn't give this instruction in the writing of the 13 books. He gives it in person to the people who had this flock, Church of God flock, who were in front of them. In other words, they could see that there was something to do for them. Look, in, look at the reason why. Look in Romans 15. In Romans 15, you can get a very clear picture of why all during this time these people who received the atonement by the gospel, preaching of the gospel of Christ, why these people should worry over these people. Here it is, plain as the nose on your face. We'll start in verse 25. <clears throat> but now I go unto Jerusalem. He wrote those words just shortly before he spoke to those Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. He says, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. The saints in Jerusalem are the saints that Peter, James, and John were the head of, were the uh, pillars of. Notice in uh, verse uh, 26, here's why. For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Just after he speaks with I'm sorry, just after he writes these words, having come from Macedonia and Achaia, he then meets with those efficient elders where he said, feed the flock. Notice he says, It hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem, the poor of Galatians 2 verse 9, or 10, verse 27, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. The word there is the poor saints at Jerusalem. It has pleased them and they, them and they are the ones who put together this contribution. Why? It has pleased those of Macedonia and Achaia and their, uh, and their debtors, that their poor saints in Jerusalem's debtors they are. Why? For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Hmm. The people of Macedonia and Achaia, and it's true of the Galatians and the first Ephesian church as well because they're part of the group. Those people have been, partake, have been made partakers of the spiritual things 
which Peter, James, and John knew about. Most people in the world today say, see, they're in the same church. There's no two churches. Oh, yes, there was, and it's not the same spiritual things, but it is the spiritual things that belong, up until this time, that they belonged unto the house of Israel. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. Here's how they became partakers of Israel's spiritual things. Verse 26, Galatians 3, verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When those people in all these places, when they, had, when they put their faith in Christ Jesus, then they probably would many of them would not have even recognized the necessity to take, a, to, to take note of this, but they did become a participant in the spiritual blessings that God had given to, promised to, and held in the hands of Israel. Notice, for as many as you've been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's like after the fact. When you're in Christ Jesus, you no longer can make those distinctions. Why? Because you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So once again, once you're in Christ, there's no distinction there. No Jew, no Greek, no bond, no free. But there was beforehand. There was. Now look at the last verse and you'll see why. And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. Everyone from the, group, from the group of elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, all the way back to Acts chapter 9 and Paul's trusting Christ as his Savior, believing on the Lord, receiving the gospel of Christ. Everyone in there who heard the message, heard the message because it went to the Jews first, wherever town they were in, and then, if you will, spilled over unto these who are Gentiles in the group. Once they're in Christ, there is no distinction, but before they trust Christ as their Savior, there was a great distinction. So what did Paul do? Go to town and find the Gentiles? No, he went to town and found the Jews. He took the message to the Jews. He went into the synagogues of the Jews. And he went and con con uh, consorted with people by the river praying who were Jews. Why were they praying? They, what were they doing out there on the Sabbath day praying if they weren't Jews? And on and on it goes. He said, but there was Gentiles. Of course there were Gentiles there. There always had been Gentiles there. All along the way, every Jew collection there ever was had Gentiles hanging on to them from the day when Moses took them and led them out of the uh, land of Egypt across the, the uh, Red Sea and took them into the wilderness. There was a number called a mixed multitude that nobody could even know. They didn't even know how to number them. They knew how to number the Jews tribe by tribe by tribe. They couldn't number the Gentiles. didn't have any method for it. And they were out there and they were following and they were getting along with them because they wanted to. They wanted to be with the Jews. Why? There was a blessing that went with them. And it's according to the promise that God made to Abraham. Notice now, it does not say, verse 29, And if you be Christ, then are you Israelites? No, 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 no. It says, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Abraham was 490 years before there was an Israel. You're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, he told them. If, it's an, if you are an heir according to the promise, you are an heir on the basis of blessing the seed of Abraham, which in the days when they were alive was indeed Israel. But you're not heirs according to the Israelites. Your heirs according to Abraham's promise. I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. I don't see how anybody misses that. Now look in chapter 4. The formation, the coming forth from Abraham, saw this. Notice. <clears throat> 
verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a, bond, a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is where the law came from, which gendereth to bondage as in weak and beggarly elements where until you desire again to be in bondage is the law back in chapter 4, verse 9. Chapter 4 now, verse uh, 25. For this Agar, that's Hagar in the Old Testament, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. That makes the children of Hagar, the children of Abraham through Hagar, which are the Ishmaelites. Ishmael, then what God promised to Ish Ishmael about being kings and whatever. He says, For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. What in the world would he mean, answereth to Jerusalem, which now is? Well, they're condemned by the law of God. Those bunch of Ishmaelites. They answer to the Jerusalem which now is. That would be the ones who held that law out there. No matter how hypocritical and, and uh, uh, phony they were, they still were the one that the Ishmaelites would have had to do with. The writing of the book of Galatians, they were still there. The Jews in Jerusalem were still there. Say, so, well, there's two groups there. Of course there was. Those who believed the truth of Jesus Christ and those who didn't. Which one do you believe God was setting up as the <laughs> judgmental council? It says right there, those which are of Hagar answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. And then he says, and is in bondage with her children. The children of Jerusalem are in bondage puts the children of Jerusalem in the same category as the children of Hagar. Verse 26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Well, you need only to, under, to understand that you need to only read Revelation chapter 21. You don't need to try to get yourself into that city to see that that truth is, is there. The Jerusalem which is above is free. It's the city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's called the bride, the lamb's wife, and it's got Jesus Christ and God the Father and the temple of God in it. What do you think it takes the place of? Everything that was temporal upon the earth, the permanency of the city takes, place, takes the place of. So he says... But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That's not a difficult passage if you really think about it through. If you don't quit trying to get yourself to be a child of Jerusalem. You're not a child of Jerusalem. You're a child of God. It's God's temple. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, notice, not, it does not say as Jacob was or Isaiah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It does not say as Israel was. It says, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. As in 23, the one born of the free woman was by promise, and so forth. We, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So when Paul wrote Galatians, then everybody in this category right here, Acts chapter 9 through 20, Somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 church, 20 congregations of people. They all had the same particular, or peculiar if you want to, distinction. They were the children of God and heirs according to the promise. The promise that God would bless those that bless the seed of Abraham and curse those that curse the seed of Abraham. Back in chapter 3, Verse uh, 16, now, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So here we are. From Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 20, Paul preached the gospel of Christ. Talk about great seed planting. Paul saw the fruit. 
he, he preached the gospel of Christ from Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 20. He said, I have planted another Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. Well, then, from Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 20, Paul could see the fruit of the planting. What did he call the fruit of the planting? He called it the seed, singular, which is Christ. So he says, of those who are in the seed, singular, he says, if you be Christ, verse 29, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And it's not about Israel. The gospel of Christ had to go to the Jew first. Therefore, it went to Israel because they were the uh, remnant, if you will, of the Jews. Israel was. So it went to the Jew first, but also to the Greek on the basis of being heirs according to the promise. Not being Israelites according to the promise or heirs into Israel, Israel's land or any such thing or the promises of God to Israel. It's the promises of God to Abraham that they were partaking in. I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. Simple as that, the promise. Now, we, you can read in both Romans and 1 Corinthians in particular, and you can see very clearly, especially in 1 Corinthians 2, this is a spiritual thing, not a fleshly thing. So it's not about the land. It's not about being able to go back and buy land that you sold out some 30 years ago when it comes to Jubilee year or any such thing as being under the law. It's not the physicalness, materialistness about being under the law. I think I said that right, materialistness. You needn't be that way. Paul says to Timothy later, you brought nothing into this world, you ain't taking nothing out. So it's not about being that way. There ought not to be in your minds as concerning the Lord anything that would make you be possessive. You may have to think about that a while too. Now, go back to Ephesians. In Ephesians 2. Start with me in my favorite verse in Ephesians. Favorite start of the passage. Verse 4. I can see myself so clearly in these first two verses here. But God who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved. And you know what? Being dead in sins, among other things, means that you don't know nothing. When you're dead in your sins, you have no spiritual thoughts. You don't start trying to figure out what God's done. You're just dead. And unless you're quickened, you'll never start thinking those thoughts. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Look back in verse 1. And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul is writing this letter to a bunch of saved people. It is my intention this morning to be talking to a bunch of people who are saved people. Not to a bunch of people who have never trusted Christ their Savior. You ain't going to figure it out. Those who try to figure it out before they give up and trust Christ always come to the same conclusion. They either give up and trust Christ or they say to hell the whole thing and walk away. They either give up what they've been trying to figure out and trust the Lord, believing that He will save them, or they walk away from it. The only difference between them and the way they do that and me and the way I did it is that when I believed I was lost, I didn't try to figure out salvation. I just simply trusted the Lord. So people say, well, when did you hear? Well, I heard a lot of times. I sang a lot of songs that had the gospel in it. I heard men preach the gospel. I listened to the radio. I've, I've probably told you about this in time past, but Dinah Washington, the singer, her dad was an old-timey black preacher in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I think it's Memphis or maybe Nashville. I heard that old man on record. I used to listen to a rhythm and blues music station out of Nashville, Tennessee, WLAC, 1610. 
on the dial. I used to listen to that late at night, especially on Sunday night. And they, they would intermix rhythm and blues music from Bo Diddley all the way up with people like Dinah Washington's dad, the Reverend whatever his name was, what Clarence, I think it was, Washington. And I listened to that old man preach. I heard a, a man in the separate Baptist preach that Christ died for your sins. I heard the man <clears throat> later on, before I got saved, I heard the man in Columbus, Indiana, the First Baptist Church of Columbus, preach that Christ died for my sins. I didn't have any question in my mind about who I was trusting the night I trusted the Lord. What did I know about it? Not very much. But I'd heard... And I trusted. It's settled. It's not a question. You see, I was dead. And the Lord quickened me. When I read this, and you want, you want to see how spiritual it's get, this gets, go back to verse 4 again. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, He, God, hath quickened us together with Christ. Well, I don't have any illusions about when I was quickened. I was quickened right here. When Christ was quickened, together with Christ. When Christ was quickened from the grave, I was quickened. Did I know that? Nope. Didn't know it for... Ten years after I got saved. Nine plus anyway. How would I find out about it? E.C. Moore pointed it out in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5. Same verse we just read. Did it change the moment of my salvation? Nope. The moment of my salvation was when I was quickened together with Christ. My realization that I needed that was in October of 1964. My realization that I could tell somebody that's why I was saved was probably about March of 1974. February, March. Nothing about that changed when I got saved. Changed what I knew. Notice again, verse 6. And hath, past tense, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't know anyone who, having trusted Christ as their Savior, could have told anybody the next day about why they already were sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know why? Because... This is not revealed until Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. So everybody who trusted Christ as their Savior from Acts 9 to Acts chapter 20 didn't know these words. They didn't know them. Did it make them less saved because they didn't know these words? Nope. They were saved. Not only that, they were sealed. The seal shows up in, Ephes I mean in 2 Corinthians before it shows up in Ephesians. What is it that people are trying to ring out? W-R-I-N-G. I don't know. Some form of elitism? I don't know. I know this. That God gave unto the world His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life, and the wrath of God abideth upon him. I know that I find that in John chapter 3 and companion verse, verses in 1 John chapter 5. Neither of those things were written to the church, the body of Christ, but they're true nonetheless. I know that from the time the Apostle Paul was saved, 1 Timothy 1 16, he did in me first. Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter after Acts chapter 9. Believe on him to life everlasting. I know that from the time Paul was saved, he could tell somebody that gospel. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures is what Paul had from the time he received it. I know that he wrote things in Ephesians and Colossians, as well as, I believe, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy in particular. 
He wrote things that he had seen and heard beforehand but could not tell and yet he told those Ephesian elders he had not shunned to declare unto them all the counsel of God. Well then I know that you don't have to know everything to have what Christ has for you. You have to know Christ died for you. You have to believe on the one who can do it for you, who can handle your salvation. Let him handle it. Let him handle it. Trust in what he did. Not what you know about what he did. Trust in what he did. Now. Notice if you will, go back and pick up on the two verses we skipped. Verse 2 and 3. The being dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Uh, been a long time since I talked about the course of this world. Maybe I ought to talk about it again, uh, maybe next week or something. I don't know. The course of this world is an interesting course. The course of this world is not a straight line. It is not the equator running straight around the world. The course of this world takes many roads, many avenues, many distractions. And yet it goes around the world probably in less than 24 hours because it's kind of like the the uh, going around the the uh, circle of the earth goes uh, faces the sun once every 24 hours. Notice he says, according to the prince of the power of the air. Well, then the course of this world is being guided by the prince of the power of the air. Well, that alone would make you know all you got to do is get into a strong wind someplace and you know that the prince of the power of the air can change your direction. Unless what you hold in your hand is stronger than the power of the air, then the air is going to change your direction. You know, it's not the wind, remember, that makes you sail. It is the set of the sail. It's not the wind that reach, makes you reach your destination. It's the set of the sail. It's not the wind that drives and is your motivating force. It's the set of the sail against the wind. It doesn't make any difference which direction the wind is coming from. It makes a difference how you turn the sail. The prince of the power of the air doesn't have to be greater than you. John said, John, not dispensation of grace, John. John said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, you believe that, don't you? Maybe not with exactly the same... Uh, 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 application that John would have made or was making even but surely you know you have the Holy Spirit of God that has sealed you under the day of redemption surely you know that's the third person of the Godhead surely you know the word of God is on your side stronger than the prince of the power of the air yeah and then he identifies that the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience well then if, how about that spirit working in children of obedience not likely if the children are being obedient. Everything's in accord with the parents. If the children are obedient, if the children of God are obedient, then we're agreeing with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. There can't be the prince of the power of the air's spirit working in us if we're obedient. Because that spirit works in the children of disobedience. And Paul makes sure people understand when this was in their life and when it was not. Verse 3, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God. Now think about this. We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Why are we not now children of wrath? Because we have obeyed from the heart that form of the gospel that was brought to us. How did we do that? We heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and we trusted Christ. We trusted Christ. We didn't trust what we found out. We trusted Christ. Not only that, we were left standing here on this earth after our trust in Christ. We were left standing here on the earth still in this body. Look in 
2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And you have to pay close attention to the word. Now, King James Bible never lets you down. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. Now, years ago, before I knew anything about rightly dividing, and I would hear people want to use this passage and they would use it as, I don't mean they said this now, but they would use it as though they were saying, if any man be in Christ, he's a new man. No, not necessarily. You know why? Because of what God says. Go back to, go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Well, there's a, an assumption made by Paul here that he's talking to people who fit verse 1, 2, and 3, and 4, if you then be risen with Christ. In other words, he's talking to people as though they've, they've put this position into their minds. Not just being saved, you understand. Verse 20 of chapter 2 says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. So it puts the question there. So, but then he, he lets them answer the question along in the doctrine by saying in chapter 3, verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ. And so <clears throat> then he follows that up with verse 5 saying, To them who are risen with Christ, whose life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he says in verse 10, And have put on the new man. But look at verse 12. He says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, on and on and on. Goes on great length. What's he just told those guys to do? He's told them to change who they are in their flesh because in Christ they're a new creature even though they have that old nature still in their bodies. They're still in the same bodies. Go back to Ephesians 4. Notice it's you doing this now. This is not the Lord. The Lord does not zap you with this when you get saved. Notice. Verse um, 20. Ephesians 4, verse 20. But you've not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard Him, and, that, and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you, and that you put on the new man. Growing up in a church that believed in works, salvation, and, and would, and would uh, uh, declare that if you did the right works, you were right with God, and if you did the wrong works, you were wrong with God, and therefore God would cast you off, and on and on and on. In that system, you could get saved and lose it 40 times a day, I reckon. But growing up in that system, we sang a song. And if it's just saved people, it fits Colossians and Ephesians to a T. If you knew you were talking, in other words, if everybody sitting in front of you had given you a testimony of salvation, you could sing this song. I'll tell you the best thing I ever did do was put off the old man and put on the new. See, that's what those two passages of Scripture just told you to do. And if you've ever trusted Christ as your Savior and you've never put on the new man, then change your mind about some things. Make the Word of God the prevalent thing in your life and let Him show you by the Word of God whether you really did trust Christ as your Savior or whether you didn't. Whether you really are saved already or whether you need to be saved. And bless your soul, it is not hard to understand if you're speaking as a spiritual man, or if you're listening as a spiritual man, if you've never trusted Christ your Savior, it's going to be argumentative to you. Because it's going to change your religion. But if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're going to know it better than you ever knew it before. 
And if you haven't, you're going to be convicted more than you've ever been convicted before. And praise God when I hear about a salvation that is that comes after somebody's been following the Word of God around for a while, and we, I could give you a long list of them. The last one I heard of was a man over in Montgomery, and praise God he got saved. Just wish he'd have been the last one. I hope you understand something of what I've been talking about here, and I hope it's a blessing to you. appreciate very much you being here. George and Mike and Daniel, Bob, Matt, Steve and Kim. Glad you're all here. Any of the rest of you that I didn't name? Probably because you didn't put your name on here. But I appreciate it very much. And I think I'm done unless you have a question. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Lord willing. And uh, if you have someplace else to go, be there. Study the Word of God with the brethren and whatever. Appreciate uh, your, your attendance here.